Hello everyone, welcome back to American Military History 1. In this video, we're going to discuss the U.S. military and the American soldier from about the 1790s to the end of the 1850s, right before the American Civil War begins. In this video, we're not going to talk as much about the major wars and battles that the U.S. military um, was involved in during this period. We're going to talk more about the experience of military service for um, the average American soldier, whether he was in the regular U.S. Army or if he was in the Navy or if he served in a volunteer militia capacity. A couple of things we should note before going forward is that the U.S. military, uh, both the regular or the professional army, the Navy and the Marines, along with uh, militia and volunteer units, took part in many armed conflicts during this period. Sometimes this period from the 1790s to the 1850s, with the exclusion of events like the War of 1812 and the U.S.-Mexican War, is referred to as uh, the peacetime army. This, of course, is not the case because the U.S. military, uh, in both the professional and the volunteer capacities, was involved in uh, many, many wars during this period. This slide lists just a couple of examples. Uh, there are several wars with other nation states and empires. There's wars uh, with Native American powers. And then there's border disputes with British Canada and then with uh, New Spain and Mexico. The U.S. military during these uh, armed conflicts played an essential role in American foreign policy, state formation, and territorial expansion. During this period, though, the U.S. military also evolved and changed significantly. Um, the strength and professionalism of the regular army increases significantly as it grows in size, as it develops new training and, and doctrine and adopts new technology. Technology, of course, changes. Arms um, become more advanced. Uniforms change as well as a result of uh, changing missions and changing war aims. And of course, the military adopts uh, new tactics and strategy to counter opposing forces in North America. The U.S. military really is coming into its own during this period from the 1790s to the 1850s, developing uniquely American strategies and tactics. And lastly, uh, volunteer units within the U.S. military, the militias, they're going to become more professionalized during this period. By the time of the U.S.-Mexican War in the 1840s, they're receiving a lot of the same training and a lot of the same arms and equipment as the regular professional army. On June 3rd, 1784, the U.S. Army replaced the disbanded Continental Army. The Continental Army, of course, was the professional army of the Patriots during the American Revolutionary War. The U.S. Army was intended to be a very small fighting force, consisting of only about a regiment of infantry and then a small battalion of artillery. Um, and throughout its uh, history in the late 18th century and throughout the 19th century, it was chronically underfunded and had personnel shortages. America's two political parties at the time, the Federalist Party and the Democratic Republican Party, had very different images for how to provide for the American common defense. The Federalist Party was much more open to having a professional standing army. The Democratic Republicans, however, preferred that militias provide for the common defense. Militias, of course, being citizen soldiers who were not professionals. They had civilian careers and they would uh, be deployed for brief periods of service to defend the country whereas a standing army consists of professional soldiers whose job it is to act as soldiers, and typically they serve for uh, multiple years of service, or in some cases for their entire career, 20 or more years. 
Throughout this period, late 1700s and for most of the 1800s, uh, very few American males wanted to join the, the U.S. regular army, uh, as well as the Navy and the Marine Corps, etc. Uh, there are several reasons for why a lot of American men did not want to join uh, the professional U.S. military. Uh, the pay was typically too low for them. Um, it ranged from about $2 to $7 a month from the 1790s to the 1840s. Uh, that's very low pay by the standards of the day. Less than half of what a basic laborer would have received in a month. Uh, the discipline in the professional military was much stricter than in the militias. Uh, whippings were very common punishments. Uh, imprisonment. Other types of uh, physical, corporal punishments were very common. Living conditions in the professional military were undesirable. Um, soldiers in the professional regular army lived in drafty fortresses on the coast or very small, isolated installations on the frontier. Sailors, of course, lived on ships. Marines lived on ships in very tight, very uncomfortable quarters. And, of course... The service itself was dangerous, um, facing Native American enemies, the British, uh, the Spanish. During the Quasi-War, they fa faced the French. Uh, all of these factors would have dissuaded um, many American men from joining the professional military. Militia service was much more desirable as it was service close to home for shorter periods of time, and it was service with people they knew in their community. As a result, the enlisted ranks of the U.S. Armed Forces during the late 1700s and most of the 1800s uh, consisted primarily of poor men from cities usually in the north. The biggest cities in the country were in the north, Philadelphia, New York City, Boston to a lesser degree. Uh, many of the young men in these cities were very poor. A lot of them were immigrants. Um, it's estimated that by the 1850s, the majority of the enlisted ranks consisted of immigrants, especially from places like the German states and the British Isles, namely Ireland. A lot of German people and Irish people came to America in the 1840s and 1850s as a result of the Irish potato famine and then the German 1848 revolution and many of them joined the regular army, seeing it as a form of steady, dependable work. As mentioned before, native-born, middle and upper-class men preferred to serve in volunteer militia units, or they would serve as officers in the regular army, which required attendance at a military academy pretty much from the early 1800s on. There were some exceptions um, of officers who did not attend a military academy like West Point, uh, but that became less common over time. And of course, these trends, um, the fact that regular army professional military service was undesirable, that military service was more, more desirable, more honorable, we might say, that's a trend that's going to be common throughout the 19th century, throughout the 1800s. Um, now we'll discuss the founding of the U.S. Military Academy, which is at uh, West Point, New York. Um, West Point Military Academy, or the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Um, it was founded in 1802 after being signed into law by President Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson actually came from the Democratic Republican Party, which had been much more suspicious and much less interested in having a standing army for the United States. Jefferson also had temporarily disbanded the U.S. Navy, believing that the United States did not need a peacetime Navy. That, of course, led to uh, problems like the First Barbary War discussed in a previous video. Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans, though, were okay with establishing the U.S. Military Academy because they believed that West Point would be used to create a new class of officers to replace the mostly Federalist officer corps that was in charge of the U.S. Army at the time. They wanted more Democratic Republicans to be in the ranks uh, or amongst the officers. And of course, um, 
West Point is a strategic location. It was a artillery supply base. Uh, it's on the Hudson River, um, just north of New York City. It's a strategic location. It's easily reached by river, river transportation being a very important form of transportation in the early 1800s before the development of railroads. And the US Military Academy is going to be very successful and it's going to inspire the creation of other private and state-run military academies throughout the country. Uh, some notable other military academies that were founded are the Virginia Military Institute in uh, Lexington, Virginia in 1839, and then the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina in 1842. So the increased number and proliferation of military academies highlights that um, military academies like the U.S. Military Academy at West Point we're offering good training uh, and creating a talented and effective officer corps for the United States. Here's just an image from the early 19th century of what uh, the original U.S. Military Academy would have looked like with uh, boat traffic on the Hudson River. Another image uh, of West Point, you can see the steamboats, which were the height of technology in the early 1800s. They might have delivered uh, cadets to the academy for their training. Uh, you can see, once again, the strategic location of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. So the U.S. Military Academies were meant to create a new group of people to become officers, Democratic Republicans as opposed to Federalists. But they were also meant to uh, inculcate professionalism and strengthen the chain of command in the U.S. military, especially in the regular army. The U.S. military, especially the army, is still professionalizing during this period. Um, most officers early on had not attended military academies. They'd already been in the military before West Point was created as a uh, military academy. And so there was a lot less professionalism and there was a lot more insubordination uh, and a lack of discipline um, amongst the officer corps. A notable example of, of a lack of discipline and a lack of professionalism was General James Wilkinson, um, senior officer of the U.S. Army in the early 1800s, um, seen on the left-hand side of the slide, the top left. For example, from 1804 to 1806, Wilkinson was the military governor of Louisiana, and he conversed with Aaron Burr, who uh, had planned to invade New Spain, what is now Mexico, and Wilkinson corresponded back and forth with Burr, which is called the Burr Conspiracy, certainly not part of his orders. Wilkinson was also accused of corruption and of choosing bad quarters for his, the troops in, under his command, and eventually he's court-martialed, but he's exonerated. Um, due to there not being enough evidence to uh, remove him from command. And of course, this corruption and subordination in uh, the U.S. Army is aggravated by underfunding, uh, very small units, um, many officers with few enlisted troops, not enough uh, things for these officers to do. Um, extremely slow uh, promotion schedules are a factor as well. It takes years for officers to rise um, in the officer corps. So many of them turn to other, other ways to advance themselves, including ways that are illegal or certainly um, go against um, their orders. Although I should say that for every James Wilkinson, for every ineffective or unprofessional officer, there were officers who did not have a lot of military training who were very successful and very effective. Uh, notable examples are Andrew Jackson, um, who we talked about in a previous video. His military training was, was limited, but he was a very successful officer. Others, like Zachary Taylor and Winfield Scott, they did not attend West Point either, but they were very successful strategists and tacticians. Um, although Taylor and Scott made careers in, in, in the U.S. Army, Andrew Jackson did not. Jackson, of course, went on to um, politics and then became president. Zachary Taylor only became president after a long career in uh, the U.S. Army. 
Here's some important information about Winfield Scott and Zachary Taylor. Um, they're worth discussing in detail because they were in the U.S. Army throughout the entire period, or most of the entire period we're discussing in this video. Neither of these men attended West Point. Um, Taylor and Scott accepted their officers' commissions in 1808. Uh, at the time, it looked like the United States would go to war with uh, Great Britain. That did eventually happen in 1812. It just happened a little bit later than a lot of people thought it would. Both Taylor and Scott chose to remain in the Army after the war. Um, both men got their military training on the job um, by studying um, the tactics used by other officers, by reading tactical manuals written uh, by European tacticians. Um, they, they learned on their own. They were self-taught military officers. Winfield Scott made significant contributions to um, U.S. Army training and, and doctrine from about the 1820s to the 1840s. He wrote tactical manuals and books. Um, he made guidelines for uniforms, um, which actually earned him the nickname Old Fuss and Feathers because he was very strict in his adherence to military regulations. Um, conversely, uh, Zachary Taylor spent a lot more time on the frontier than Scott. Scott spent most of his military career on the East Coast of the United States. Um, Taylor, however, was deployed to Florida for the Second Seminole War. And he was deployed um, early on to um, the Texas-Mexican borderlands during the, the U.S.-Mexican War. Scott only uh, was deployed to Mexico later in the conflict. And Taylor, um, true to where he was deployed, was called Old Rough and Ready. And Taylor was much less interested in military regulations. He often wore civilian clothing. And it was said that he was not as concerned with military regulations as other officers around him. And he was often mistaken for a civilian. Now that we've discussed some of the leading uh, generals and commanders of this period, we should discuss the U.S. military's mission from the 1790s to the 1850s. Um, the primary mission of the early U.S. Army was to act as a frontier constabulary force, uh, which would be used to project power and to expand and integrate territory on the western frontier. These territorial expansions came often at the expense of uh, the British in Canada or at the expense of Native Americans. The U.S. Army often took uh, part in joint operations with Native American assets and allies. It also worked with uh, militias and volunteer forces, which were administered by the states, although typically they were commanded then by officers from the regular U.S. Army, which often led to friction between regular U.S. Army officers and officers in these militia volunteer units. Throughout this period, though, the U.S. Army, the regular army, remains very small comparatively, um, typically not more than 8,000 troops. In times of war, like the War of 1812 or the U.S.-Mexican War, the U.S. military would be augmented by volunteer units um, taken from the state militias who would bolster um, the strength of the U.S. military and would be um, much larger in, in terms of numbers than the professional U.S. Army. And the image on this slide is uh, of the Legion of the United States, an early uh, regular army unit commanded by General Anthony Wayne from 1792 to 1796. Uh, the Legion of the United States took part in the war against the Western Confederacy in Ohio, which we talked about in a previous video. So militiamen make up the bulk of the U.S. military, and they work alongside the U.S. Army. American men generally prefer to serve in militias rather than the regular army. Um, some of those reasons were militias serve for much briefer periods of time. Early in this period, militias only served typically for 90 days. Later on, uh, volunteer units, which were taken from militias, would serve for one year, as was the case during the U.S.-Mexican War. Regular enlisted men served for multiple years at a time. Officers served for at least four years 
after um, their four years of education at West Point. So service as a volunteer in the militia was much shorter of a time commitment, making it much more desirable. Also, the uniforms and the training uh, could vary uh, widely depending on which uh, state, which militia unit, um, a prospective uh, civilian chose to join. Um, they were serving typically with people they knew in their communities, friends, in some cases, family members. Uh, arms and equipment also would vary in these uh, militia units. Uh, free civilians who joined these militia units um, provided their own weapons or they paid a small amount of money when they joined to have a weapon a firearm provided for themselves. During this period, civilians have access to very similar arms as professional soldiers. Um, they didn't have uh, modern notions of, of gun control at this point in American history. Uh, civilians and soldiers both were armed primarily with um, muzzle-loading, single-shot muskets and rifles. Generally, these militia units, they served as infantry using uh, muskets and rifles. Uh, some served as cavalry and artillery as well, but cavalry units, of course, were much more expensive to maintain because they had horses, and artillery required um, a much higher startup cost, as well as additional training for uh, the members of the unit. So artillery and cavalry, militia, volunteer units are less common. They still existed though. During this period, militia and volunteers could be effective in combat when they were properly trained and commanded, particularly if they were commanded by an officer who had uh, regular army experience. Um, but the level of discipline amongst uh, volunteer militias was much lower. These were men who served for much shorter periods of time. Uh, they typically knew each other, were friends with each other. Their officers were often their friends. So there was a, a lack of military discipline. Officers did not want to punish they, their, their men for breaking military regulations. Um, militias also were democratically operated where enlisted militiamen voted for their officers. A strict martinet officer would be replaced with a more lenient one. So for a lot of reasons, um, volunteers and militias were much less strict in terms of discipline, which made them much more desirable for prospective um, civilians who wanted to join the military. But this also led to them being less disciplined, less cohesive in combat. Also in armed conflicts like the US-Mexican War, um, what we would call war crimes are much more likely to be committed by uh, volunteers than by regular soldiers. Regular soldiers had a higher level of discipline and were much less likely to attack civilians because it went against their military regulations. Militias also were used as a uh, internal security force, as like a paramilitary. Um, they were also used for uh, to suppress uh, slave uprisings. A couple of examples are Gabriel Prosser's uprising in 1800, Denmark Vesey's uprising in 1822, and then Nat Turner's uprising in 1831. Um, local and state militias uh, played a role in suppressing those, those slave uprisings. Now we'll discuss some of the uniforms and equipment used by U.S. Army soldiers and then by um, volunteers and militiamen uh, during the 1790s up to about the 1850s. And discussions about uniforms and equipment are very important because the uniforms and equipment that a military issues to its troops are a reflection not only of the tactics and strategy that military is going to use in combat, uh, but also they're a reflection of the culture and society that produced that military. So we're going to take some time to discuss um, this material or in military terms, you know, arms, equipment, and uniforms. So the military uniforms worn uh, by the U.S. Army, they evolved significantly from the 1790s to the 1820s. Um, you see that on their coats, they're made of dark blue and dark gray wool. Uh, these are fairly inexpensive colors. Um, blue is made from indigo. Indigo can be produced in the United States, particularly in South Carolina. 
where it's grown on uh, large plantations. Blue uniforms, of course, also are a callback to the American Revolutionary War. Uh, as far as um, trousers go, they're of a lighter color, but they become darker over time. Uh, darker colored trousers, of course, are much easier to keep clean. Uh, it's much more practical. You see them go from white to gray to eventually to blue over the course of this period. For cover, um, enlisted wore high crowned um, brimmed hats, uh, like on the image seen on the far right. Uh, they also wore what are called shako hats. Um, these are designed to make the soldier look taller and more intimidating when he is standing in a close order drill uh, in, in combat. Shakos, of course, are not nearly as practical if you are engaging in stealth-based tactics. But the majority of uh, the regular U.S. Army's training is focused on uh, close order drill and fighting other um, militaries that are fighting in close order drill, especially the British and then eventually Mexico. Uh, this type of uniform is much less practical for fighting against Native Americans who preferred stealth-based uh, combat and strategies. Uh, as far as things like uh, grooming regulations, um, longer hair of the Revolutionary Era fell out of style uh, in, in favor of shorter hair. Um, although this regulation was not always very tightly enforced, um, the only place it was really enforced very strictly was at places like West Point where cadets were expected to have uh, short hair. Um, facial hair was um, not permitted unless it was above above the upper lip. So sideburns are permitted, sideburns are common. Uh, mustaches were permitted, but they were not very popular. Uh, mustaches don't really become popular until after the 1840s. American soldiers began growing mustaches during the U.S.-Mexican War that they copied the Mexicans who, who grew mustaches. And the U.S. Um, Navy and Marine Corps had similar um, grooming regulations during this period. We'll talk about their, their uniforms uh, on later slides. Here are some modern war reenactors um, wearing uh, reproductions of, these are War of 1812 era U.S. Army uniforms. You can see the dark blue and some gray uh, jackets being worn with light colored trousers, which while very stunning to look at, are very impractical uh, in the field. Officers are wearing uh, Napoleonic style chapeau hats or bicorn hats, they're often called. You can see the uh, reenacting officer wearing this one here. And he's also carrying a saber. Um, sabers were issued to officers who used them not so much for combat, but to uh, as a symbol of uh, strength and authority uh, to rally their troops in battle. Later in this period, from about the 1830s to the 1850s, um, U.S. Army uniforms become a lot plainer. Uh, you see that campaign or undress and then dress uniforms are going to be used, uh, especially from the 1830s on. The U.S. Army during this period is fighting in places like the swamps of Florida, as seen here in the 1830s and early 1840s, and then in the dry deserts of, of Texas and Mexico in the southwest, as seen here. So the uniforms become a lot more practical. Uh, jackets and trousers are made either of sky blue for infantry or dark blue for officers, artillery, and cavalry. Um, trousers are either dark blue or uh, sky blue. Much more practical colors, although contemporary observers, particularly from Europe, always remark that American soldiers had very plain, very simple, very unintimidating uniforms. But Unintimidating uniforms were a lot better because they made the wearer less of a target and they were just more comfortable to wear. They still were not very comfortable though. These uniforms, winter uniforms were made of wool. Um, summer uniforms, which were only sporadically uh, introduced, were made of linen. But most of the time soldiers wore uh, wool uniforms, even in places like Florida and Mexico. Um, so comfortable is a, a relative term. Uh, the covers in this period are a little bit um, more unassuming. Uh, they're replaced with what are called forage caps. Um, this is a leather forage cap that was worn in the 1830s. Uh, 
It was meant to be waterproof and meant to be practical for a place like Florida, but the soldiers hated wearing them because they were very hot. Um, they, they heated up in the sun, as, as you might expect. By the 1840s, they wore uh, cloth forage caps or peaked caps, um, which were a little bit more comfortable to wear, but still they provided very little sun protection. Oftentimes, uh, soldiers would throw away their forage caps and replace them with wide-brimmed hats, which, of course, was against military regulations, but a lot of soldiers did it anyway because it was more comfortable. In the 1850s, um, they don't wear forage caps as much as they wear what are called kepis. This is a French style of cover, also not very practical, but it does inspire later um, covers and headwear like the baseball caps uh, that people wear today. So you can see that um, U.S. Army uniforms evolve based on um, the needs of the soldiers on the ground. They become simpler, they become a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more unassuming, a little bit more um, um, under the radar, which allows the soldiers to be less, less clear targets for their enemies. And also they're a reflection of American culture during this period. Um, the Americans wanted to move away from super flashy uniforms, which they associated more with Britain and with Europe and with also Mexico as well. They wanted to have a simpler, more democratic American style uniform. Here are some modern war reenactors wearing reproductions of uniforms from the 1830s and 1840s. You can see the sky blue uniforms, grayish blue uniforms worn by infantry soldiers. You can also see that officers wear longer um, dark blue coats. We can witness similar trends in how uh, U.S. naval uniforms evolve um, from the 1800s to the 1850s. They become much simpler over time. These are early, early examples of naval uniforms. On the left are officers' uniforms, which are very flashy. They're wearing um, short pants or knickers, as they're called. Knickers, of course, spelled K-N-I-C-K-E-R-S. Um, you can also see enlisted sailors' clothing. Uh, it doesn't change quite as much, but it's designed to be worn um, in a way that allows sailors to go about the very difficult manual labor that's part of their duties, uh, much plainer, of course, than, than what officers wear. From about the 1820s on, um, U.S. sailors' uniforms become a little bit plainer, a little bit simpler. Officers begin wearing long trousers, um, some officers still wear Napoleonic style chapeaus, but many of them are wearing uh, simpler peaked caps, which are much more practical, much more comfortable. Um, you can see a variety of, of sailors' uniforms being worn both at sea and then for uh, deployment on land. Occasionally sailors were deployed on land um, as in, in a capacity as infantry. So these uniforms become simpler and more practical with time, just like the army uniforms. You can also see how um, U.S. Marine uniforms evolved um, from the time of the American Revolution to the end of the 1850s. I would say they're the one um, branch or section of the U.S. military whose uniforms actually become a little bit um, more ornate with time. You can certainly see how uh, the uniforms of U.S. Marines from the mid-1800s go on to inspire the U.S. Marine Corps dress uniforms that are worn today. Now we'll discuss the uniforms and equipment used by uh, U.S. militia, U.S. Rangers, and U.S. Volunteers. Um, remember that militia service is considered to be more honorable and uh, more desirable than regular army service during this period. So um, you're getting a larger um, section of U.S. society in these uh, militia units. Uh, in some ways, what the militia is choosing to do with their equipment, with their uniforms, is more, ref is more reflective of the values and concerns of American society. Um, than the choices made by the U.S. Army and Navy, which 
are much smaller and represent a much smaller section of American society. Remember, it's mostly poorer, often immigrant men who are joining the uh, enlisted ranks in the Army and Navy, and a very small section of, of men make it as West Point trained officers. The militias and the volunteer units are open to a lot more people in American society at this point in history. On the frontier, uh, frontier militiamen and rangers often wore um, clothing um, inspired by Native American cultures, uh, as was the case in the colonial time. These hunting jackets remain very popular um, uniform choices for uh, militia soldiers on the frontier and for rangers. Um, also, they use weapons that were used by Native Americans, axes, tomahawks, a variety of knives, in addition to using uh, muskets and rifles as their long arms. As far as um, covers go, militia soldiers um, tend to wear civilian head headwear that's much more practical wide-brimmed hats, fur hats, whatever is comfortable and, and fits with their mission. So there's a level of adaptability here that's uh, very, very important. Civilian clothing of a variety of other styles is worn by uh, militia and volunteers. And in some cases, uh, militia and volunteer units also wear uniforms patterned off of those worn by the US Army. But basically, there's going to be adaptability based on region, based on mission. And there's also going to be a variety based on um, just the individual tastes of the unit or of the individual soldier. These, these militias are much less standardized than uh, the US Army is. They do, however, become a little bit more standardized across this period, certainly by the 1840s. Here are some additional examples of uniforms worn by uh, militia soldiers, um, people who joined these volunteer units from the 1790s to the 1850s. Different versions of hunting jackets are worn um, during this period, highlighting um, an interest in Native American culture and traditions. Um, you can see these soldiers here are wearing some type of moccasins, uh, much more practical for soldiers on the frontier who are engaging in stealth-based warfare. Remember, the, the boots worn by um, European Americans or Euro Americans during this period were very stiff, very hard. They didn't even have uh, right and left shoes until about the time of the Civil War. So moccasins uh, were a, a good choice for many uh, militia soldiers, especially on the frontier. Different types of civilian clothing could be worn, sometimes with um, a like a white band or a red band to denote unit membership. Um, this is a photograph of a militia or volunteer soldier from the U.S.-Mexican War. He has a military-style forage cap worn by regular Army soldiers, but he also is wearing uh, civilian clothing, including what is called a rifle shirt or a battle shirt. It's similar to the hunting jackets worn uh, earlier in this period, but much plainer and much simpler. It doesn't have the fringe. It's not nearly as long as the earlier hunting jackets. And actually, hunting culture is going to have a significant impact on um, the culture and on the uh, uniforms worn by militia and volunteer soldiers. Here are a couple of photographic examples of volunteer soldiers. Um, these are both from the US-Mexican War. This is a collection of volunteer cavalry with regular officers. Um, they're at a Mexican town called Saltillo. Um, that's spelled S-A-L-T-I-L-L-O. It's in uh, northern Mexico. Volunteer soldiers towards the end of the U.S.-Mexican War began to wear uniforms very similar to those of the U.S. regular army because as their volunteer militia uniforms, which were um, had a lot of variety as they wore out, they were replaced with much more standardized um, US Army uniforms. It's also interesting, uh, the, the photograph on the right-hand side of the slide, it features one of the first known images or photographs of a person smiling in a picture. 
Um, typically, people didn't smile in, in, in early photographs because of how long it took to take the picture. The exposure time was several minutes long. Here's a couple more examples of uh, uniforms worn by uh, volunteer soldiers. These are from the U.S.-Mexican War, 1840s. Um, as I mentioned on a previous slide, hunting culture and influences from hunting were very evident in the uniforms and in the uh, equipment carried by the volunteers. But there's also local variations too, once again. Um, on the right-hand side of the slide are the Mississippi rifles. They were um, armed with 41 caliber uh, hunting rifles. Uh, these were smooth bore uh, rifles, uh, single shot, um, used by hunters, uh, fairly similar to what a regular army soldier would have carried at this time. Although in, in this case, the Mississippi rifle was actually a, a, better, a better weapon than uh, the U.S. Um, army regular soldiers musket. Being that it has rifling, it's much more accurate than a smooth bore musket. Um, the Mississippi Rifles wore red hunting shirts and canvas pants. Um, these, this is a very common um, hunter's garb from the early 1800s. Other, other militia and volunteer units like the Texas Rangers of Texas, they wore buckskin coats and uh, buckskin pants and, and um, what are called chaps. They wore a fusion of Native American and Mexican clothing. So you're seeing um, influences from hunting culture, but also local variations. Now we can discuss some of the long arms used by the US military. We'll focus primarily on those used by the regular US Army because the long arms and side arms used by uh, volunteer militias vary considerably. Sometimes volunteer militias used older, leftover, surplus um, U.S. Army long arms. Uh, in other cases, they bought uh, civilian firearms, which were at the same level as those used by the U.S. Army, or in some cases better, as was the case with the uh, Mississippi rifles I talked about on a previous slide. So early in the period we're talking about, um, 1790s to 1850s, the U.S. Army primarily issued smoothbore flintlock muskets to its infantry soldiers. A good example is the Model 1822, uh, 69 caliber uh, musket shown on this slide. Of course, it's a smoothbore um, because, and it's uh, muzzle loaded, meaning it's loaded from uh, the front, not from the breech. There were some breech loading long arms like the Hall breech loading rifle. Here is an example, uh, a flintlock version and also a percussion cap version. These were loaded from the breech, um, single shot. They were very unreliable and very expensive. Um, they could be fitted with bayonets. Um, all of these could have been fitted with bayonets, um, which of course are useful in a hand-to-hand -hand combat situation. After 1842, the US Army began to um, replace the flintlocks with percussion cap ignition systems. Percussion caps are much more uh, reliable. Um, they can be used uh, much better in inclement weather. Um, remember, a flintlock works by placing a small amount of powder inside the pan, which is then covered by the fizzin. Um, but if water gets between the pan and the fizzin, the musket will not fire. A musket fitted with a percussion cap, however, uh, is much more reliable. If this area becomes wet, this is called uh, the nipple, by the way, the, uh, the musket can still fire. So what you'll see is that flint locks are replaced by, by percussion lock or percussion cap ignition systems. And then smooth bores are going to be replaced with uh, rifles. Smaller long arms, uh, namely shortened muskets called musketoons and uh, carbines are going to be issued to cavalry and artillery. Now we can discuss some of the sidearms used by the US military. From the 1790s to about the 1830s, officers and mounted soldiers would have carried muzzle-loading smoothbore flintlock pistols. 
like this example here, which is a model 1819, 52 caliber. After about 1836, however, uh, officers and mounted soldiers uh, began to carry the Samuel Colts uh, 28 to 36 caliber um, five round revolver seen here. Revolvers, of course, had significant advantages over single shot uh, pistols that were used previously. They could be loaded with multiple rounds. And this actually led to significant tactical advantages for American soldiers, particularly during the U.S.-Mexican War. These revolvers were the height of technology being less than 10 years old. And uh, U.S. soldiers armed with revolvers would face off against Mexican cavalry armed with various types of uh, single shot pistols. And the Mexican cavalry would charge at the American soldiers with revolvers thinking the American soldiers having fired one shot were out of ammunition when in fact they really had four more rounds left and that led to uh, significant tactical advantages. Um, similar pistols and revolvers are going to be issued to sailors and Marines as well. Pistols and revolvers, of course, um, being ideal weapons for naval combat, um, you know, close quarters combat uh, that you might expect to see on a naval vessel. In addition to bayonets, um, the U.S. military issued other um, bladed weapons to its soldiers. Um, officers and cavalry, especially dragoons, were issued sabers. Um, good example here is the Model 1840, which has a 35-inch blade. Artillery, artillery were issued um, a short Roman-style sword uh, with a 19-inch blade. This short Roman sword was probably not used uh, for combat, but used for things like clearing brush or cutting down trees, um, clearing land, the kind of thing that an artillery unit would need to do in order to uh, properly place their, uh, their guns, their, their cannons. Even though the U.S. Army issued uh, blades to its soldiers, it did not invest very heavily in... Um, training or sword training for its for its troops. It was said that um, blades were a last resort weapon and that if a U.S. soldier had to resort to fighting a uh, an opponent with a blade, he only had about a 50-50 chance of surviving that, that engagement, that uh, battle with a uh, enemy combatant if it came down to fighting with swords. So the sword training was, was very lacking during this period. U.S. volunteer militiamen uh, might purchase sabers for their own use, um, but their favorite blade was probably the Bowie knife, uh, invented by James Jim Bowie in uh, 1830. Um, you can see an example of a Bowie knife here. They have various, um, various styles, uh, various features. The most common feature with a, a Bowie knife is that it's got a very long blade. It's often longer, more than a foot long. It also has a um, an inset on the blunt side, which is called a tang. That's spelled T-A-N-G. Um, very, very sharp, very good um, for close quarters battling and also useful for um, non-combat activities uh, like gutting a deer, for example, to supplement one's rations. And the Bowie knife became associated with hunting, the frontier, with dueling, and with masculinity, especially for uh, Southern volunteers who, who liked carrying Bowie knives. So now we should discuss who was commanding all of the people who were wearing these uniforms and carrying these uh, guns and swords and knives. Well, an important um, part of the U.S. military's leadership during this period was the officer corps um, that came out of West Point, the U.S. Military Academy. Um, a new generation of West Point trained officers um, begins to replace the older self-trained officers in the 1830s and early 1840s. The officers of West Point tended to come from uh, the middle class or from well-off families who had come on hard times. Uh, these were families that wanted their, wanted their sons to have a college or undergraduate education, but they couldn't afford to send them to a university. Um, 
a four-year uh, degree at uh, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. It was free, but entrance um, into the academy for potential cadets was very competitive and required a uh, letter of recommendation uh, and a congressional appointment. So it was people who, um, whose families were perhaps down on their luck, who couldn't afford um, a civilian university, but also the potential cadets had to be very good students and had to be very uh, talented and, and bright and intelligent young, young men. Um, this is certainly true for people like Robert E. Lee, um, see at the top on this of this slide, and then Ulysses S. Grant on the bottom. Lee was from a uh, wealthy family that had lost its uh, money and its prestige uh, during uh, Lee's lifetime. And um, going to West Point and serving in the military was a chance for Lee to um, become an officer and to help regain some of his family's lost prestige. Ulysses S. Grant went to West Point um, shortly after Lee attended, and Grant was from the middle class, although his family was not an especially wealthy family. Um, Grant himself had, was very ambivalent about attending West Point. Uh, initially, he was very against it, but he became used to it. But he did say that he was very happy when, uh, when he finally graduated from West Point, saying it was one of uh, the happiest days of his life. So even though the, um, the U.S. Military Academy was, was creating a um, very good class of, of officers, uh, many Americans, especially those who supported the Democratic Republican or the later Democratic Party, really didn't like West Point. They, they thought that um, having a regular officer corps was um, too aristocratic. It was undemocratic. They thought that professional military officers who stayed in the military long term as their career were lazy, that they should be in the civilian world, in the private sector. And so there were attempts actually to shut down uh, West Point. In 1830, um, uh, Davy Crockett, you know, famous Davy Crockett from Tennessee, as a congressman, introduced a bill to uh, shut down West Point, which thankfully did not pass. And of course, the efficacy of these West Point trained uh, officers was proven during the U.S.-Mexican War. And many of these officers who had uh, been friends and comrades in Mexico and at the academy would go on to fight on opposing sides during the U.S. Civil War. So while service in the enlisted ranks of the regular U.S. Army was not very honorable, not very desirable, uh, service in the officer corps of the regular army had a modicum of respect that came with it because of the difficulty of service, because of how selective West Point was about who it admitted as cadets. Um, so young men who had few economic and um, social opportunities for upward mobility, if they had um, you know, good enough grades in school, if they had connections, um, they could get into West Point and uh, develop a level of um, social respectability through their service. Although occasionally there were people who still looked down on them for being professional soldiers as opposed to being part-time citizen soldiers like the militiamen. Ulysses S. Grant, um, he told a story about how he wore his cadet's uniform home um, and was mocked by a young boy who said that because he was a soldier, he did not work for himself. So that idea is still common, but being a regular officer is much more um, respectable than being an enlisted soldier, which has very little respectability during this period. But both are still considered to be less desirable than serving in a militia as a citizen soldier, as a volunteer. Uh, the last thing that um, we should think about with these West Point officers is that uh, many of them, when we're trained to civ civilian life, um, they had a lot of success, uh, particularly in anything related to science or engineering. Uh, the curriculum at West Point during this period was very focused on engineering training. Um, so you see that a lot of um, veteran uh, West Point officers, they were very successful as railroad and canal engineers, construction managers, industrialists, inventors, scientists, authors, bankers, educators, and, and a lot of other positions in civilian life. Their military training um, and then 
the culture of what, what, what one historian called authoritarianism and gentility that they learned at West Point allowed them to be successful both as officers and then in, in civilian life as well. And of course, some of these officers also entered politics, and some actually went on to command volunteer militia units during conflicts like the U.S.-Mexican War. A good example of a former West Point officer who then went on to command as a volunteer officer was Jefferson Davis, a future president of the Confederate States of America. He actually commanded the Mississippi Rifles, um, the soldiers who wore those red shirts uh, that we looked at on a previous slide. There were many occupation specialties or types of services um, within the U.S. Army. Soldiers at the time thought of these different types of services as being branches of service, a little bit like how today we have the U.S. Army, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Marine Corps, etc. as branches within the U.S. military. All of these types of services would probably be considered occupation specialties in uh, present day military terminology. Um, the occupation that was the most uh, prestigious in the U.S. Army at this period was um, being an engineer. The engineers um, were typically the best performing West Point graduates. Um, cadets who graduated at the top of their class often went on to become engineers. Notable examples are uh, Robert E. Lee was an engineer, um, and he was a top performing student in his class at West Point. Uh, the second most prestigious was service in the cavalry or in the dragoons. Um, these men were uh, often deployed on the frontier, and horsemanship um, was associated with masculinity during uh, this period in American history, so it was a very desirable uh, type of service. Uh, the third most prestigious was artillery service. Um, in order to be an effective artillerist or cannoneer, um, one had to um, know mathematics, had to know targeting. Uh, all of those things were very important, so it was a fairly prestigious type of service. Many um, future Civil War generals started out in the U.S. Army as uh, artillery commanders. Infantry service was a lot less prestigious. It was seen as being simpler. Um, infantry officers were deployed with uh, infantry units throughout the country. The conditions in which they lived could vary significantly. Um, typically, people who lived um, in big population centers, like engineers, had much nicer living conditions than um, cavalry and infantry who were uh, deployed on the frontier. Quartermasters were the uh, least prestigious uh, position that a officer from West Point could take. It was seen as being um, those who could not um, handle the pressure of combat or handle uh, effective leadership. They would be sent to the quartermasters. This was where those who per performed at the lowest of their classes in, in West Point, they typically went to the quartermasters. There's also an animosity between line officers, um, soldiers who serve on the front, and then staff officers who serve in the rear. And these occupation specialties um, were very important in uh, the U.S. Army during this period. So we'll talk briefly for a moment about engineers. Uh, the engineer's role was very important um, and a major part of integrating uh, Western territory with the rest of the United States involved the, the building of roads and canals, uh, and the construction of forts and dams to prevent flooding. In 1805, the Army Corps of Engineers was originally founded. Uh, and they would, of course, engage in a variety of engineering and construction projects um, throughout this period. In fact, the majority of the West Point uh, curriculum was based on engineering. Um, this is why so many um, men who had gone through the officer corps, uh, they went on to be very successful uh, civilian engineers, civilian construction managers, civilian uh, scientists and inventors. The engineering training they received at West Point and the engineering products they uh, completed uh, 
during their time in the army prepared, prepared them for civilian life. And of course, early on, you can see the uh, Napoleonic style of the uniforms. This is from 1805. The uniforms worn by engineers, like the rest of those worn by the U.S. Army, become a lot plainer and simpler with time, reflecting um, uh, changes in American culture as American culture became more Jacksonian, more egalitarian and democratic. And then, of course, as a new American identity emerged, in contrast to the identity of, of Europe. And of course, very flashy uniforms are just not practical in a combat situation, uh, in combat deployments. Service in the cavalry, especially in the dragoons, was also very desirable. Um, dragoons uh, is a term for cavalry armed with uh, long arms, with a type of uh, musket or rifle, and that then the dragoons fight from horseback. They don't fight uh, dismounted. Um, Cavalry typically are armed with um, swords and pistols of some kind, uh, whereas dragoons are armed with long arms and sabers and swords. Uh, dragoons, of course, fight from horseback. Cavalry fight from horseback. Other types of mounted soldiers are um, mounted infantry who ride horses but then dismount for combat. And dragoons, because they were armed with long arms, um, they had more, they were more effective uh, in terms of accuracy. And because they could fight on horseback, they could better engage um, Plains Native Americans who also fought on horseback. So they were ideal for deployment in uh, the Great Plains and also in the Southwest. Um, the Native Americans of the Southwest were very skilled equestrians. And the Mexicans were also very skilled um, horseback riders as well. So the dragoons were ideal for engaging uh, enemies like this. Um, the dragoons acted as a frontier constabulary, covering large distances on horseback. And they also acted as explorers. Uh, in the 1830s, uh, U.S. dragoons uh, made an expedition through uh, the Rocky Mountains, for example. Um, the term dragoon falls out of favor, though, at about the time of the Civil War, as the Union Army, um, facing the massive tasks of defeating the, the Confederate States of America, it begins to standardize everything. And so you see that the dragoon units are turned into regular cavalry units, as cavalrymen are then armed with revolvers and repeating rifles. There's not really a, distinct, a difference between a dragoon and a cavalryman at the time of the Civil War everything becomes a lot more standardized. Service in the artillery was um, desirable as well, but less so than service in uh, the cavalry and in, in, in the engineers. But the artillery played a major role in um, U.S. military success from the 1790s to the 1850s, especially during the U.S.-Mexican War uh, in the 1840s. Technological advances, um, military education provided at military academies, and industrialization really allowed the U.S. military to maintain um, skilled artillery units equipped with the most technologically advanced uh, guns and ordnance by the standards of the day. In fact, uh, in the U.S.-Mexican War, the U.S. Army is uh, dominant in terms of artillery. They use a variety of artillery pieces. Um, you have small, highly mobile mountain howitzers like the ones seen on this slide. Uh, these mountain howitzers could be collapsed and um, placed onto the backs of mules. They didn't have to be towed by um, carriages or, or caissons and limbers, as they're often called. Larger artillery pieces are used for uh, things like coastal defense, siege guns. Um, there's a variety of artillery pieces designed for a variety of missions. Um, adaptability, of course, is key here as it is with many other aspects of the US military during this period. Um, many future Civil War generals started their military careers in the artillery. A few examples are Braxton Bragg, Thomas Stonewall Jackson, and William Tecumseh Sherman all got their starts in the artillery.
Here are some examples of the variety of artillery pieces used during this period. Uh, on the left, you can see a what's called a Columbiad cannon. Um, it's used for seacoast defenses, very important in conflicts like the War of 1812, um, protecting American ports from the British Navy, the most powerful Navy in the world. You can also see a small cohorn mortar. Mortars like this uh, were used um, in, in sieges. They could fire very short distances, but they fire uh, at very high angles, so they can be they can launch their rounds uh, over enemy fortifications. On the right is the Model 1841 Mountain Howitzer, which I mentioned on a previous slide. Um, this artillery piece was used um, with great effect during the U.S.-Mexican War because it was highly mobile. It could be moved very quickly around um, the battlefield. On one occasion, Ulysses S. Grant, who was at the time commanding an artillery unit, he ordered that a mountain howitzer be taken apart and carried up um, into the bell tower of a church in Mexico. That way, um, the artillery unit could then fire on the Mexicans more effectively from um, the high place of the uh, bell tower. And of course, all of the um, the artillery pieces we're talking about in this period are smoothbore and muzzle loading, meaning they're loaded from the front. Uh, they're not rifled. Um, they have smooth bores. Rifled cans are going to become much more common uh, during the U.S. Civil War from like the 1860s on. And breech loaders are also going to be introduced in artillery from the Civil War on. But during this period, you're seeing primarily smooth bores and muzzle loaders. U.S. artillery um, production was usually of a very good quality, although there were um, incidences where this was not the case. Perhaps the most, most notable was the explosion of the Peacemaker gun aboard the USS Princeton in 1844. Um, during the explosion of the Peacemaker, um, several American civilians were killed, including uh, the U.S. Secretary of the Navy and the U.S. Secretary of State. Um, so there's always exceptions. exceptions to um, American technological uh, dominance with artillery. So now that we've discussed things like uniforms and arms and equipment, we can discuss just the daily life and the daily experiences of, of uh, U.S. Army soldiers. We're talking mostly about regular um, soldiers, career soldiers in this case. Some of these experiences uh, will also be uh, a part of the daily lives of volunteer soldiers. But remember, volunteers, they only serve during wartime. Uh, regular soldiers serve during wartime in peace. So they, they experience these things for a lot, uh, for much longer periods of time. Army service included long periods of boredom, punctuated by very short periods of danger and fear. Danger and fear during combat, during um, raids and attacks by the enemy. Um, camp and garrison life, um, in many cases, was more hazardous, generally was more hazardous than combat. Um, disease kills a far great, greater number of, of soldiers than combat wounds does during this period. Although disease um, was much more likely to kill volunteers than it was to kill regular soldiers. Regular soldiers, because they were used to living um, in military bases, um, with a lot of other people. They tended to have better immunity to diseases. Also, their military discipline was a lot higher. They kept themselves cleaner. They kept their camps cleaner than the volunteers did. So um, volunteers are much more likely to die of disease than um, regulars were. Um, the daily routines in garrison focused on things like drills, uh, fatigue duty, which included digging trenches to um, uh, use to hold um, garbage and waste to prevent disease, um, building fortifications, uh, very monotonous work. Uh, there was no um, boot camp or basic training in the modern sense during this period. Uh, West Point cadets experienced a training camp that's a little bit like modern day basic training, but for the most part, American soldiers, both enlisted regulars and um, militia and volunteers, they don't have an intense training period at the beginning of their military service. So most of their training is taking place on the job. 
uh, once they've reached their duty station or, or the garrison that they've been assigned to, or once they've been deployed to enemy territory, that's when their training begins. And it's oftentimes training or a, a trial by fire, by combat. Um, duty on the coast uh, involved living in drafty casemate forts uh, like Fort Sumter, shown here. Uh, living in these forts was not desirable. They were cold. They were damp. Uh, diseases like tuberculosis could be common. Uh, but living on the frontier and in less permanent camps could also be very uncomfortable as well. Diseases like typhoid and cholera, uh, dysentery uh, affected uh, troops in these garrison camps. And you also see that the desertion rate is, is very high during this period. In some cases, as high as one in three uh, soldiers in the regular army are deserting. And desertion is also a problem for volunteers as, as well. And you see high desertion even among troops that are not deployed to combat zones, meaning that it was not fear of, of combat or fear of battle that was leading troops to desert as much as it was the poor living conditions. As mentioned on the previous slide, disease uh, and illnesses, and in some cases wounds, were a part of the experience of U.S. soldiers during this period, both regulars and uh, volunteers and militia. Disease was still the greatest killer, but soldiers died from combat wounds as well. Uh, medical and surgical techniques were very primitive by today's standards. Amputations were very common. Um, as a way of preventing infection. Uh, anesthetics were used when available, uh, especially ether after the 1840s. Also things like laudanum were used, and of course alcohol can be an anesthetic as well. Um, army surgeons, like all physicians in the period, had very limited knowledge of germ theory and antiseptics, so infections were very common. A soldier might survive a uh, surgical amputation only to die from an infection. By the way, the image of this on this slide shows an amputation being performed by uh, U.S. Army surgeons in the 1840s during the U.S.-Mexican War. Uh, you can see some of the equipment and the saws uh, that would have been used to perform amputations. Uh, surgeons would prescribe drugs to their patients. Some of these drugs are more effective than others. They prescribed a laxative uh, like calomel. Calomel is very poisonous and a, it's no longer being used by the time of the Civil War. Actually, during the Civil War, they stopped using calomel. Laudanum is also used. Laudanum is basically opium mixed with alcohol. It's used as a pain reliever. And unfortunately, uh, many soldiers become addicted to laudanum, uh, just as many people are addicted to opioids today. Uh, in general, enlisted soldiers, uh, both volunteers and uh, regulars, had a very um, uh, low opinion, very negative opinion of uh, U.S. Army surgeons. They believed that U.S. Army surgeons uh, were butchers, they didn't know what they were doing, or they believed they just made soldiers sicker in many cases. So uh, you can understand that medicine in the U.S. military was uh, very lacking. One of the reasons so many uh, soldiers got sick, though, was because of the poor rations they were um, issued during this period. Um, Army rations generally consisted mostly of dried bread and dried meats, with some dried uh, peas and dried beans included as well. Very, very little uh, fresh food. Um, fresh meat and fresh bread usually were only issued in uh, garrison um, when, when those products could be provided to uh, the troops by, by contractors. Daily rations typically consisted of about three quarters of a pound to one and a half pounds of dried beef or salted pork. Um, the meat was typically very fatty, and even though it was dried, it often spoiled and would be covered in a bluish green mold. It would take on a kind of a sticky um, consistency. That's what soldiers from the period wrote about the meat they were issued. Um, quartermasters would either issue one pound of flour or one pound of bread. Um, sometimes the bread was made fresh, other times it was made uh, into these hard crackers called hardtack. Um, obviously, 
one pound of flour will make more than one pound of bread. So oftentimes army quartermasters would take that flour and they would sell it or make it into other bread, which then they could sell themselves. Honest quartermasters would take the money that they had made from selling the excess flour and they would put it back into their units. But um, less honest quartermasters might just take that money and pocket it for themselves. Another reason why quartermaster service was often looked down upon as being undesirable. The U.S. Army did not issue fresh fruits or vegetables on any regular basis. Instead, the uh, War Department actually experimented with having soldiers grow vegetables themselves in gardens in the 1820s, but this plan was abandoned because it took too many uh, soldiers away from combat duty. Um, instead, soldiers, if they wanted fresh foods, they would have to um, supplement their rations through foraging. Um, which foraging meant taking food from the countryside. But that often put them into contact with um, civilians and often put them into conflict with the people they were occupying who did not want to have their food confiscated. And foraging was a widespread practice uh, amongst American soldiers from the 1790s to the 1850s. Um, Due to challenges in contemporary military uh, logistics, the U.S. military high command kind of assumed and expected that its troops would forage food um, to add to their rations. Um, foraging would become even more important as supply lines would become stretched on like the frontier, uh, especially during conflicts like the U.S.-Mexican War. In some cases, as, as soldiers got further and further from uh, their bases, uh, their bases of supply, they would have no rations issued to them and they would have to rely entirely on foraging. And of course, foraging is also important where there's no infrastructure assets or what were called internal improvements in uh, 1800s vernacular, where there's no canals or steamboats or railroads to bring supplies to the front. Um, soldiers would have to instead forage uh, food around the front. Uh, the downsides, of course, of foraging is that it can be dangerous as small groups or patrols or foraging parties uh, go out to collect food. They can be attacked by uh, enemy troops. And of course, confiscation of foods um, would anger uh, local and indigenous populations and would lead to um, animosity between civilians and the occupying U.S. forces. The U.S. military also issued liquor rations to its troops. Before 1832, the U.S. Army issued about a cup of liquor or whiskey, usually, to soldiers. Um, before the 1820s, roughly, scientists believed that alcohol was healthy and it was a stimulant, kind of like how we view coffee today. Um, the temperance movement that takes place in the 1820s and beyond really changes this um, idea that alcohol is healthy and stimulating. Instead, alcohol was regarded as being a more negative, uh, a more negative uh, beverage. Um, before the 1830s, alcohol was issued to soldiers and to sailors, but there were strong punishments for drunkenness. Soldiers might purchase extra alcohol and um, use it to get drunk. Uh, they would purchase it from private contractors who followed the army. The, these private contractors were called sutlers. Um, officers often drank as well, um, and they wanted to keep uh, the men and their commands from drinking. They believed that the enlisted could not be trusted with alcohol, but officers could be trusted with alcohol. Although there's plenty of reports from this period of officers um, drinking to excess and becoming drunk and uh, becoming derelict in their duties as a result of drinking. Over time though, a culture of temperance, a culture of restricting alcohol becomes more common in uh, the US military, really across all branches. And so by 1832, the US Army bans um, the, the liquor ration and really starts to um, um, enforce regulations against uh, alcohol consumption amongst enlisted soldiers. Of course, enlisted soldiers will find ways to drink alcohol illegally. 
um, and they will debate whether it's right for uh, regulations against alcohol consumption to be permitted. Uh, some soldiers will argue that uh, by making alcohol consumption illegal, that's going to encourage excessive drinking because a soldier will not want to be caught and will drink what alcohol he has to hide it, or he will binge drink at the one occasion he has access to alcohol. So there's a lot of debate about um, how much alcohol uh, soldiers should be allowed to drink, if any. But on the whole, a culture of temperance and a culture of eventually prohibition of alcohol um, takes hold in uh, the U.S. military. The U.S. Navy will actually ban uh, alcohol rations in 1862 during the Civil War. A couple of final things to note. Um, the relationship that Native Americans have with the U.S. military. We've discussed this in, in other videos, but I want to um, emphasize it again here. Uh, contrary to what some might think, uh, the United States military often had Native American allies um, in the early Republic and in the antebellum periods. On the whole, um, more Native Americans tend to side either with the British or just preferred to remain neutral in these armed conflicts. Some of the notable Native American tribes that sided with the U.S. during this period uh, are the Lower Creeks and the Cherokee and the Chickasaw and the Choctaw peoples who fought on the U.S. side during the War of 1812. Uh, Native Americans will serve as guides and as hunters um, for the United States military during the U.S.-Mexican War. And there's limited numbers, small numbers of, of Native Americans will actually serve in uh, regular and in volunteer um, units in the U.S. Army. But those numbers are very, very limited uh, as a result of regulations we'll talk about in a moment. Even though um, some Native Americans fought for the United States and were important allies, um, the U.S. government still um, had the Indian Removal Acts in the 1830s, and these Indian Removal Acts did include peoples like the Lower Creek, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, and the Choctaw. Uh, they had been allies of the United States, yet they were still removed from their uh, homelands in the eastern U.S. and sent uh, to the West forcibly. And the U.S. Army and militias facilitated this forced removal uh, of their former allies to west of the Mississippi River. So the U.S. Army was working um, in tandem with Native Americans in some cases, but was also working to dispossess them of, of their lands as well. Um, we should also mention uh, African-American soldiers in the U.S. military during this period. Um, African-American soldiers served with distinction in the War of 1812 and other, other armed conflicts in American history. Over this period, though, the U.S. military really becomes a lot more anti-black and really just becomes um, much more anti-non-white um, people. Um, black men are fully barred from serving in the U.S. Army by 1824. Um, Non-white men in general are barred from service about this time as well. There's occasional reports of, of black or of Native American men serving in, in the U.S. Army, but these... These accounts are very, very isolated, very rare, um, and it would certainly would have been against regulations to have these men serving. Black men will continue to serve in the Navy, but over time their, their service becomes much more restricted as well. Um, in 1839, um, regulations are put in place to make sure that no more than 5% of the ranks of the U.S. Navy are made up by black men. Um, the U.S. Marine Corps had barred non-whites from serving uh, from the beginning. Um, the Marine Corps is not going to allow um, black members until the 19, 1941. Uh, black men could still serve uh, the U.S. military in other capacities, though. They could serve in militia units. Um, African Americans often founded what were called free men of color units, in which uh, black men served together in units they created themselves. Um, black men also served as scouts, uh, guides, and hunters during uh, conflicts like the U.S.-Mexican War. 
and some black men acted as servants or um, served unwillingly as, as slaves for U.S. military officers. So they were involved in the U.S. war effort, the U.S. military in that case, against their will. White Americans had seen their military service as an important part of their citizenship and their masculinity, and seeing black men in uniform serving in the military threatened a lot of the pro-slavery and pro-white supremacy arguments that were becoming very popular in America at the time. So now we'll wrap up this video. Um, the U.S. military advanced significantly during the early Republican and antebellum periods, as, as we discussed in this video. The military, both the regular professional army and the volunteer militias become a lot more professionalized, a lot more standardized. And of course, um, the military will play a major role in American statecraft and territorial advancement during this period. The U.S. generally preferred to rely on volunteers and militia, seeing the citizen soldier as uh, being honorable and the professional soldiers being much less honorable. But regular army service will become more honorable and more professionalized during this period. As mentioned before, militia units are going to become more standardized and professionalized, uh, especially by the time of the U.S.-Mexican War. The militias are going to um, receive very similar training to the regular army. Their uniforms are going to become a lot more similar to those of the regular army, and they're going to abide by a lot of the same military regulations as the regular army, although it has to take, it takes time to get to that point. And a similar approach to the common defense would be taken by the Union during the U.S. Civil War. Um, the Union Army consisted uh, about 97% of volunteers taken either from state militias or from civilians who served um, for brief periods of service during the Civil War, not people who signed up for long-term military enlistments. Although they were uh, trained and equipped similar to regular Army soldiers, even though their military service was meant to be uh, much more brief. During this period, uh, the U.S. Army also embraced new technologies, materiel, tactics, and strategies to better fulfill its mission. And uh, those missions, of course, primarily were to act as a frontier constabulary and a territorial expansion force, providing security on the frontier from attacks from Native Americans or potential attacks from uh, Britain or potential attacks from other countries like Mexico or to invade uh, Native American territory or to invade uh, British or Mexican territory as seen during the War of 1812 and the U.S.-Mexican War. Remember that regular army service is less desirable um, than militia and volunteer service, but regular army service did offer poor and immigrant men uh, work opportunities through enlistment service. The officer corps um, offered better opportunities to more middle class men who did not have economic opportunities in civilian life. On the whole, though, the average American male preferred to serve um, as a volunteer in one of the militias because the service period was much shorter, the military discipline was less strict, and they could serve with family and with friends from their communities. On the negative side, of course, the U.S. military, even as it becomes more professionalized, becomes more te technologically advanced, helps to create a stronger, more uh, secure United States. It's playing a role in uh, the dispossession of Native Americans. Uh, it's playing a role in invasion of other countries like Mexico. And um, the US military is becoming um, more of a white supremacist force as it bans uh, non-white people, particularly black men from service. So there's positives and there's negatives with the US military and with the common uh, American soldier in, in this period.